child, it doesn't save your your screens. So you're all safe. Okay, so we're gonna start off by just uh, just talking a little bit about low and high key value. Okay, so what we're going to do is um, we're going to just create like a gradation of value on our page. And um, once my screen starts sharing, then you'll be in good shape. Okay, so go ahead and sort of um, find a spot on your page do it off to the side somewhere. And I want you to just use your tool and make a little area of black. And I want you to push as hard as you can and make it as black as you can. <laughs> Pardon me. So as dark as you can make it. I'm using the term black because um, it's just kind of like the symbolic darkness I'm sort of asking you to think about, but in reality, of course, it's not black. And then I want you to start to pull the tool out from the darkest value and gradually with control, get lighter and lighter. And so one of the things that you're noticing I'm doing this is that like, I'll actually almost like pull out the value and then go back over the previous value and make it darker. You can do up and down like vertical lines or you can do small concentric circles. The benefit to the small concentric circles is that it doesn't show up as much. Now, if you watch, this is why drawing uh, standing up is helpful. So if I'm standing on this side with my tool on the right, it's easy for me to go up and down. It's less easy for me to go up and down when I'm standing to the left of my paper. Actually there, it's easier for me to go left to right. So it's, it's harder for me to get the same sort of sensitivity when I'm standing to the left of my paper. And so, you know, the way that you set up right now might really um, affect your success. So I want you to, to gradually, gradually gradate the values and lift off the tool with your pressure so as you get closer and closer to the white of the page, you're lifting less and less and less. So go ahead and work on that for a minute. Okay, so, um, I'll, I have a lecture on the Mincel system and I'll put it into the power into the, the canvas site for you. Uh, you don't, you know, you won't be like quizzed on it or anything like that. Um, but basically, the main thing I want you to recognize is that each color that you see has these three attributes, the hue, which is the name, the chroma, which is the saturation and the value. Now, if you like to do digital work, you'll notice that when you do digital work, even on sketchbook, that you see these three attributes on your color palette when you select a color. And they're often like you have like that circle here. And then down here, you often have H, S, L, hue, saturation, and light. And so that's the digital translation of hue, chroma, and value. And so on sketchbook, you know, you have the circle and outside the circle are all these pure colors. And then inside the circle, if you remember, is a diamond. And you can select a color within the diamond that correlates to its saturation. So usually there's white here, there's black there, 
there's gray, and then there's 100% color. And so as you move the little slider around, it changes the value and the saturation of the color. So that's something to go back and look at. Um, it's a fun thing to do. So value is lightness or darkness. Value is relative. So by that, I mean that a value is read by the values around it. So if I have, you know, if I have the darkest value I can create and I put that on my page, let me lower my camera here. Sorry, I know that was a bit bumpy. If I have this value and it's surrounded by white, then it looks really, really, really dark. But if I take that value and I surround it by other values that are also darker than the white, now it doesn't look as dark as it did before because it's being read in correlation to these values. So that's what it means when we say value is relative. Value is read by the values around it. So this is one of the reasons why when we get to charcoal, I often have you tone your paper so that your paper isn't white. And that will eliminate this like bright, like glaring value everywhere. And it will be a more true way to apply value to your page because the page will not be white, it will be gray. So value is light and dark. Value is one of the attributes of color and value is relative. So if we go back to the idea of the Munsell system, in Munsell, we have this rod of value that runs down the center here, okay? And in the original Munsell system, he identified 10 steps of value from white to black. The Munsell system now has 37 steps of value <clears throat> that can be uh, assigned to a color. So depending on who you read, Black and white in terms of numerical value, sometimes the numbers are switched. So sometimes we read that black is zero and white is 10, meaning that black has no light at all and white has all the light at 10. And sometimes you read it vice versa, okay? But we're gonna go with zero for black and 10 for white. And so in the Mincel system, then we'd have 10 at the bottom, which would be black. And then we would have zero at the top, which would be white. This correlates to this idea, which is linked to um, the, this notion that came about, I can't remember if Newton actually coined it. I think it was Newton, but it was right around Newton's time, which was that color could be read like music. And so, if we divide this little blended space here in half and give that a number five, we then can call these low and these high. And so we start to refer to these as low key and these as high key. Okay, so low key is like five to zero on the value scale, high key is five to 10. So <clears throat> this correlates to this idea that they used to have, and they would have a symmetrical color wheel. And then the center would be um, uh, white. And then the space would be divided into <clears throat> notes. And I don't remember what they are, because this never really was something that I applied. But the idea would be like, if you, you have like an F, and so like F would be like a note on the piano, and that would represent red, and you'd have like G, and that would be like yellow, and then it would get closer to white or outside would be more pure color, and that would indicate it's like where it sat on the scale in terms of it was a flat um, or a sharp kind of thing. And so this idea, the only thing that I really took from it was this idea of low key and high key that I really think is applicable. 
uh, this system's been replaced now, especially digitally by the Mansell system. Uh, and then there's two other systems that we generally teach. Um, so when we're drawing, if I'm drawing with you, like, and you've turned a drawing in or you showed me a drawing and I say, well, you need more low key values. Those are gonna be the values that go towards the darks. If I say you need more high key values, that means that you're going to move the values or work in the values that are more towards white, more towards lightness. Okay. So the last term to really cover then, sorry, I know it's shaky when I do that, I apologize, is uh, the term light logic, which we've kind of discussed to think a little bit. So light logic. So what does light logic mean? Anyone? So just look at the two words. What are the two words? So light and logic, what are the two, pull the two words apart. What do they mean? How you use your light logically in your training. Yes, <laughs> perfect. Sometimes things aren't as complex as they sound, right? Like it's not as like, so you have light and logic, you put it together, you get light logic, and that is the logic of the light in your drawing, all right? So this takes you spending some time familiarizing yourself with the way that light affects form, um, which we do a lot of in class, and it's a little harder to mimic that at home, but we're going to play around today with maybe hopefully adding to your awareness of how this works. So I'm gonna grab a clean sheet here. You don't need a clean sheet. Um, I'm just grabbing one for you. Okay, so here we go. So go ahead and you're gonna take your tool now. You made your, you know, find another place on your paper. I'm gonna move this up and over so I don't waste a lot of paper here. Okay, so go ahead and take that tool and you're gonna go ahead and just draw a boundary box. How big do you want the box to be? You decide, I'm not worried about it. Not small. The reason I say not small is because I don't want you to draw small, which would require to use a lot of precision grip. I don't want precision grip. So in the center, just go ahead and feel a circle. Now you can see when I'm doing that, I'm using like my whole arm. I'm not using my wrist. I'm just feeling that circle. Draw nice and light, do not draw darkly. I'm drawing just a hair darker because I need you to be able to see it, but I want you to draw as lightly as you can. Remember, you're always gonna have an easier time pulling the tool down the page for your circle rather than pushing the tool up. Then we're just gonna assign a horizon line and draw it straight through the, the object. Again, draw lightly, otherwise you won't ever get rid of that. Then we're gonna pull light from the top left side. So if the light is coming from the top left, then logically the shadow will fall to the right. So go ahead and create your shadow down there. It's gonna be kind of like a little squished egg. Now this is a gesture drawing, y'all. This is a gestural drawing. Uh, it, you know, how is it different from a sketch? To me, sketches are a little bit longer than gestures. But when you're doing a gesture, you're thinking about the whole space rather than contour, which is all about a moment and a detail. So then just go ahead, like through here, there's gonna be a little bit of a curve like that. Okay, now that's basically gonna be the, 
the gesture. And now we're going to start to work in with the value. So one of the things is that when you're working with value, uh, you know, we're looking at blended spaces. All right. Uh, so by that, I mean that we recognize that there's going to be spaces where values transcend edge. So go ahead and very lightly apply a value through here. And I want you to transcend it off the ball into the into the shadow. And then transcend it out of the shadow onto the space around here. Now you're not going to do any erasing, so don't you dare draw darkly. And the only place we're not applying any value right now is on the light of the ball. Wait, sorry, when you said the value transcended the line on the ball, can you just show us what that looked like again? Mm -hmm. So this is the, the bottom of the sphere. And mm -hmm. I just moved the value across into the shadow. I didn't stop. Okay. What I'm Thank saying you. is that this, this value here is the same as this value here. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. So gesture, mass draw. So this is like mass value drawing. These are about wholeness. So they're, they are a holistic way to draw. You're thinking about all of these different components, all of them together versus contour, which is about a single moment that is then translated to the next single moment that next explores the next single moment. We're not really thinking about wholeness so this is more about gestalt than it is about contour. So gestalt being about the grouping of form visually. So once we've done that, then we can start to stay like, okay, well, we know that there's going to be that all these value places that we made, they're not all going to remain like this. So we know that after in the sphere that there's the light area and then it goes into like the midtone which is the space between light and and the darkest area so coming through about here and the reason i can do this is because i've done it so many times and i understand the light logic that's needed follow the idea of the contour of the sphere and through there go ahead and assign or darker value. The darkest part of the shadow, we call that the core of the shadow. It's going to come through here where we are right now. Don't make it super dark yet. You want everything to remain malleable. Okay, so next, we're going to think about that dark core shadow that we just made here. And now the darkest place in our drawing is going to be the shadow line, which is where the sphere touches the surface. So we can assign that and you can assign that dark. Now all value is relative. So now we've seen what that darkness is there. We can see that this is actually still uh, like a six or a seven on the value scale. If this is going to be, uh, blah, 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 blah. What did I, how, which way around did I do yours? 
uh, low key, yes. So this would be a six or a seven on the value scale here maybe, and this is gonna be a, uh, I've forgotten. I think yesterday I did, I did zero to 10 the other way. Hold on, I just wanna check so that it makes sense to you all. So black is zero. So then this will be about a nine, uh, a, a one if black is zero. So this is gonna be about like a four. So the area that's like your four, go ahead and darken that a little bit more. And you can use circles, but you wanna keep everything really tightly together. You don't want a lot of marks right now. Now, what's gonna happen down here, so I just darkened that a little bit. I'm gonna blend it in. So at the bottom of the sphere, this is your shadow line. Above that right here is going to be reflected light. So reflected light is a light that is gonna get trapped between the sphere and the table. We talked about that, I think, in the video on my egg drawing. So blend that core shadow down towards the bottom of the sphere, but don't bring it all the way to the shadow line. Now, depending on how close the lamp is that's projecting or a light might be, the core shadow could be even darker. It just depends on the closeness of the lamp or the light source. Then from the core of the shadow, go ahead and start to blend up into your light. I'm almost, you know, I'm like feather light touching the surface here. Just letting the tool do what it needs to do to apply some value to the page. I'm using little concentric circles, which I can control. Now you remember in your skull drawings that uh, we looked at like the contours of the light and the shadows and that's kind of what we're trying to create down here. So you're gonna have the shadow line and you just wanna, you have a very brief amount of space to blend that out and it goes light and then it goes dark again. Is there always reflected light with something like a sphere? Typically, yes how much determined by how close the light source is to the object. Okay. So this is just made up land. And so in made up land, that's how much reflected light we have on the inside the shadow. The outside edges of the shadow are gonna be a little bit lighter, but the inside of the shadow will be darker. Now in the first lecture I gave, we talked about value, open values and closed values. Okay. And so does anybody remember the difference between open value and closed value? Okay. So if I take my hand and my hand is, I wanna make sure I'm doing, making a shadow. So there's my hand, right? It's a very open value. It's not defined. The edges are not defined. It's very much open in the sense that it's more of like, you know, just a shadow across the page. Now, as I get my hand closer to the paper, it becomes more defined, you see? And so that would be a closed shadow or closed value. So the further away it goes, the more it is open, 
because the less defined edges are visible in the shadow. Sorry, my iPad went to sleep. Okay, now, we wanna make the light step out further. So what we wanna do is in the background back here, bring the value up to the edge. Like so. So by making the background dark, now that light area steps forward. And we can see that this darkness back here against that light looks pretty strong. But over here, we can almost find that we can almost just blend that background right into the sphere. So when we look at value, we wanna squint our eyes because that pulls all the values together and makes them more contrasty. The reason is because in your eyes, you have rods and cones and your rods activate better with less light. And so when you, your rods are what sees the value. And so when you squint your eyes, you're diminishing the amount of light, which makes your rods more active, which pulls together the values. So in class, I'm always telling everyone, squint your eyes, squint your eyes, squint your eyes, so you can see the values and people are reluctant to do it. And then I sort of remind them that if everyone's doing it, then you won't look silly doing it because there's a, a sort of a self-confidence thing that happens. It's interesting we, the way that humans function. And we can strengthen our dark value in here. Strengthen this dark further. And sort of Bob's your uncle. Okay, so what we're going to do is I'm just going to pause the recording ahead and resume the recording. So we talked a little bit, uh, you know, you read a little bit about Mark and you made your little compositions um, for your drawing. It was really interesting to me that a lot of the compositions um, that I went through didn't have any overlapping of marks. A lot of them were like one mark in this section, one mark in that section, one mark in that section. And that's not necessarily Incorrect. It's just interesting to me that there was hesitancy to transcend marks on top of each other to overlap marks. So, you know, one of the things that we we looked at and talked about uh, in terms of the mark making was like, what kind of marks can you make with your tool? So I want you to sort of practice it for a minute, trying out different types of marks, and I want you to do this with control. So by that, I mean, it's like pick one section to make darker. And then I want you to try to lighten your touch and bring the value gradually towards white. 
with the same mark. And so like, this is a mark that I like to do. It's like very natural mark for me, which is kind of like this angular scribble crosshatch. So see what happens when you make mark larger versions of the mark and more close knit versions so that the area gets darker and more intense. So let's do a couple of different types of marks and see what we can do. So there's like my scribble. And then why don't you do one with circles using more of the side of the tool. and try to control that and bring that towards light. For me, that one's a little harder. And then maybe just a nice classic like directional line. And I want you to really practice like holding the tool at different in different ways with different pressures to see what you can achieve. So we do that until 930 it's 927. Okay, and then we're moved to the next thing. And so y'all are gonna have to talk up if you've got questions and stuff, which I hope that you do. Um, and so um, let's go ahead and start off by just using the charcoal paper to do the same thing we did before. Let's just go ahead and make the darkest closest to zero value we can. I want you to do the same exact thing I want you to see how much harder you have to push to fill the texture in. But then as you pull out, changing your pressure, you should start to feel that it's easier to, Sorry, I'm thinking <laughs> it, you should start to see or feel that it's a little easier to um, be lighter, I think, because the texture of the paper starts to become a way in which you can gauge tactily on your hand the values that you're applying. Okay. 
So same thing, but with the pastel paper, I want you to feel the difference. Hey Vaughn, I don't have my pastel sketchbook with me because I'm not at my house currently. And I just wanna know if I can still use the mixed media to receive credit. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Okay, sweet, thank you. Yeah, I do prefer Professor Vaughn. <laughs> do you know how much money <laughs> I have to pay? Sorry. Do you know how much money I had to pay to get that title? Oh my it's gosh. Fine. Sorry, I'm sorry. No, it's fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. So here we go. My high school kids, when I taught high school, used to call me Vaughninator. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> Some of them still follow me on Instagram and they're writing to me and be like, Vaughninator. Um, so you should feel the difference in the texture, okay? And um, this is key, I think, because where the texture is coming through, and Ava, there's two sides to the mixed media paper. One of them tends to have a bit more texture, so you could try that side um, now that I think about it. Um, and one side's smoother. So see if you can try it, see if you can feel the difference. Okay, that's good to know. Okay. Um, so we can see where the texture of the paper is coming through like in here. And so think about it this way, right? Like if you play the, the, the situation correctly, the content of the white that's coming through will also adjust your pressure, well, oh, sorry, also adjust your value and how it reads. So now you've got two things that you can uh, utilize to create lighter value. You got your pressure and also the way that as you adjust your pressure, the texture of the paper um, starts to reveal more of the tone of the paper, which adjusts the value. So let's go ahead and um, let's see if I can zoom out a little bit. I need a bit more space here on the old frame. Now you're working on the nine by 12 pad. It's a little bit smaller, um, which is fine. So um, go ahead and make this to the size that you need it. Go ahead and lightly create a boundary box. Okay, and then with that boundary box, we're going to just throw in a two-point perspective cube. I had to unplug one of the lights to plug the computer in, so I lost some of my lighting. Um, so go ahead and create a horizon line, nice and lightly. Be helpful if I make one line. Uh, Create your two vanishing points. Okay, and then let's go ahead and just make a um, two point cube below the horizon line. So there's our corner. Connect, 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 connect. Don't worry about it being perfect. I don't. I don't need it to be perfect. Left side is closer to the left vanishing point, so we we'll make that side smaller. Right side is further away, so we we'll make that side longer. Now we have a point here and a point there. So that goes to this vanishing point back there. This goes to that vanishing point back there. And so now we have the top of the box. Just do your best. When I draw it, it's always for like Bob Ross, just do your best. You're in control.
happy mistakes. I have that app called Calm that like lets you, you know, like teaches you to like meditate and stuff. It's very bossy. It's always telling me to take deep breaths and things. But they have like ASMR and like one of them is Bob Ross. And you just like listen to Bob Ross as you go to sleep. <laughs> okay, so now we're gonna assign our light logic source. So we're gonna pull our light from the bottom left. Okay, so that means that this side here is going to have a value it's going to be a little darker, closer to the brightest edge. And then as it goes back, it's going to get, it's going to all be dark, but it's going to get just a hair lighter as it goes back. So you want this to be a pretty high key value. Now the top is going to get less light because of the light logic. We want that to be a lower key value. And then we can have our shadow line there. Now this side's dark on dark because it's already a shadow. And so then we, the shadow line goes in, it gets darker because it's dark on dark. To find that edge again and blend out. And like enjoy the texture of the paper. Now, very lightly, then we're going to pull our light source here. Like it's hitting that. Getting smaller as it goes towards the corner. And then let's go ahead and around that space. And again, transcend over or you know, transverse over the dark parts of the cube. And then let's start to work on making the back back here darker. If you don't want to lose the back edge of the cube, you can solidify it and blend from the solidify edge into the value. Professor Vaughn, mm -hmm. are you just making that right side, everything below the horizon line dark? Mm -hmm. Okay. Like in here? Yeah. Okay. And it's your little box. If you, you know, you decide if you don't want it make that dark, that's, that's all right. I love the sound of the tool on the paper. It's so cool. And what I'm trying to do is like keep the definition of the box while simultaneously 
almost like blended away. So it's tricky. If you have a box with a light on it and a background value and a surface value, I'm, I'm going to be happy, y'all. It doesn't have to look like mine. Now, all quarter long, we've been studying line and we've been studying perspective, and there you just saw why right like hopefully you very quickly and easily created a, uh, a two-point cube you understood how form sits in space so the construction of the form was the least difficult thing to do i hope then you're able to just play. You know, we spent the first part of the class kind of learning the vocabulary of space. Now we're going to learn to write poetry. If I may be so cheesy. <laughs> so let your drawing kind of tell you what it needs. We're just making it up so you're free of the limitations of observation. But the logic should still remain the same in terms of the light logic. I'm gonna create my boundary box. I'm gonna draw something a, a little bit strange, but um, it's fun to do. Okay. Go ahead and do your horizon line. Two points. corner here. So it connects there, connects there, connects there, connects there. Now the shape we're going to try to make is basically like a french fry. Okay, so think about the thickness and the length of a french fry. So we want kind of like a thinner left side and a longer right side. Ultimately, the size doesn't matter. You just want it to be shaped like this. You don't want it to be shaped like this kind of thing. That's more of a cube. We want a nice long and thin 
shape. <coughs> Just by eyeing, go ahead and divide it in half. Sorry, it should go to the vanishing point. And then divide the space in half. Then a vertical line and a vertical line. Okay. So then go ahead and round out like this. Round out like this. Round out like this. On the top, you're going to actually follow down a little bit. So you're going to mimic this and go to a point, mimic that and go to a point, mimic that and go to a point. Same thing over there. Go ahead and apply a darker value here. Blend this through here. Here, you're going to do a little arc up, a little arc up. You're going to do a little arc down, leave space, arc up. And so we get to start to play around with the shape of a finger. Fingers are a hard edge on the top and soft on the bottom because you have the padding on the bottom. Okay. So you can start to play around with, and my finger might be a bit too tall, so I can actually shrink it down. So you can start now to play around with the way that values might affect a rounded form. So maybe it's darker at the bottom and then blends up. So don't lose the little distance between this part of the nail and the outside edge, but make sure that you don't just draw random lines through here. Each knuckle is like a fold in cloth. So it has a dark area and then it has a light surface. And to define the light surface here, you would put dark over here. So when you look at knuckles, it's not just a single line. It's actually value. And you can put a little value onto the nail. When I do this, I always it makes me think my brother has 
the prosthesis on his finger. He has um, his pinky. He cut off part of his, most of his pinky. And so my, uh, you know, the family, whatever, like wanted him to get a prosthesis. And he was kind of like, I don't really need it, but fine. And so they, you know, got this like really expensive, you know, the doctors made this really expensive prosthesis finger that looked like his skin tone. It looked like this, like a real perfect finger. And he never liked it. He, he didn't like using it. And so he would just find it fun though, being the age he was to leave it around the house. So like you would come across this like perfectly, <laughs> you know, this like hyper-realistic finger like in his apartment or he would come over to my parents' house and like leave it in the kitchen. I think it was all he ever found it to be used, be like useful for was like freaking people out. It always reminds me when I do this, it's just like this finger floating in, in the middle of nowhere, you know, disassociated from a hand. Then you can start to trans, you know, for value of the background onto the side of the figure. Let's give the finger a shadow. And still might be some reflected light in there. some clouds back here. You don't have to do this. You could do whatever you wish. I'm just playing. It's vital in drawing that you play. When we're meeting on campus, I often have students do like 80 or 90 pages in the sketchbook of just different ideas and prompts. And I found the first time I taught teaching drawing online, I couldn't do anything like that because it was impossible to ask students and unfair to ask students to take 90 photographs. But get a sketchbook and just fill the sketchbook with doodles. Doodling is the way to go. You learn a lot by doodling. So there where you can see that taking the two point rectangle, we can now turn it to something more complex. Okay, last little drawing and then we're gonna go over your homework. So see if you can find another place on your page. Go ahead and create your boundary box. OK. 
Okay, in the center of the box, put a circle. And then just go ahead and find the center of the circle and then put another circle. And then another circle. Okay. So what we want to think about is um, we're going to look at the idea of the sphere and um, how it can be turned into something like the eye. Okay. And so when we look at the structure of the eyeball, um, the eyeball sits inside the eye socket and that would go around like this. Okay, you don't need to draw that bit if you don't want to. It's, help. it's not bad to do so. That is created by, there's a little sutra there. So on the bottom you have the maxilla. There's a little sutra here. Over the side you have the zygomatic and then on the top you have the frontal. And those are the bones. Excuse me, Professor Matt. Oh, is it not showing the thing? Sorry. Um, that's weird. I didn't stop sharing it. Did it just turn off by itself? Is it not showing my iPad? It's showing something, but the iPad? I think it was just lagging because I can yeah, see I something that just popped up. Oh, uh, OK. <laughs> I was like, wait, what am I showing you? Um, <laughs> um, so we have in the center the circle, which is the eyeball. Then we have the iris and the pupil. OK. And so that sits inside the eye socket, which is a, a concave space in the skull. You don't need to draw the bones if you don't want to, but it's helpful to think about it. There's a suture right here, which um, is the difference between the maxilla that's on the side, the frontal bone that goes through here, and then down through here, the zygomatic bone. Inside the eye socket, you have the lacrimal and the sphenoid bone. Now surrounding this whole area is the orbicular oculi, okay? And that's the muscles, it surrounds the whole eye, and that muscle basically um, helps to um, open the eyelid. I might be close the eyelid. I always get them confused, but that's this big muscle. But then the one muscle, you know, that we see a lot of is the top eyelid. And that you can put in like that. That's the levator palpebrae superioris. Now, not everybody, but um, if you're European, uh, you might have a crease. And you can kind of think about the crease as the uh, levit levator palpebrae kind of folding around the eyeball. So we have basically two types of eyes that we generally see, hooded and monolid. And depending on where you are in the world, um, you know, you have um, different ranges within that. Um, ah! Sorry, I dropped my earphone. Different um, ranges of visible crease within those two sort of like delineations. So monolid, we kind of think more about sort of Asian eyes. Um, there's a less pronounced uh, crease and hooded, you kind of tend to think of this more pronounced crease. Um, you never want to sort of like show a ton of the iris and the, the, and the eyeball. It'll look like everyone's really scared. Generally, we're going to see part of the eye being cut off by the eyelid. Um, 
on the bottom here, you can just find the bottom of that iris that you made and a little bit above it, create the other side. It's kind of like an almond shape, depending, you know, obviously I'm just making this up. <clears throat> every eye is different and every eye is beautiful. I love when we start drawing the figure because we get to really look at just the, the gorgeousness of the diversity of the human body. Now you can go ahead and apply a value through here. So that's going to be the color part of the eye, the iris. And you can bring that into the pupil. Okay. We're going to pull the light from the top. So in that scenario, this part of the eye will be a little bit darker. That creates the shadow for the crease. The eyelid is lighter, but it casts a shadow down over the eyeball. The white of the eye is the scilia. So we're gonna blend that darker shadow down onto the white of the eye, the scilia. Over here we have the tear ducts, which are like little baby spheres by themselves. So the tops of them will be lighter because that's the light coming down. Then there's a thickness to the lower eyelid, which if you wear eyeliner, you know about. And then on the other side of that thickness would be a little bit of darkness. Y'all, I hardly ever, 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 ever do eyelashes. Okay, it's really hard to pull off eyelashes without them looking like they're completely like fake. Here I would use directional line. The iris tends to have these lines that kind of radiate from the center. And so I, I would mimic that with some directional line. It's important to note the thickness of this lower eyelid and to note the thickness of the upper eyelid. Now, this is where I like to think my bags come from. Like I just have like a really like, I just have like a really strong eyeball. But you usually get a definition of the muscle through here. And you can kind of think about it correlating to the lower part of the eyeball. Now over here on the outside edge, I would make that a little bit darker and move it towards the center, let it get lighter. And then over here, because remember our light's coming through here, a little bit darker. I'm gonna get lighter as the, towards the center. So I actually have a lesson on drawing eyes and it focuses on um, Asian eyes and um, utilization of like using online resources to draw all these different types of eyes, like old eyes, young eyes, and then you also will do some studies of your own eyes too. So this started, that's the sphere. And so everything we learn about the sphere correlates to drawing the eye. And everything we learn about drawing the egg correlates to learning to draw about the head. And that's why next week we're start eggs.
right, I hope I caught that sneeze in time that you didn't get your ear, um, your ears destroyed. <laughs> okay.